All right, so welcome back. Um, so once again, I'm gonna show you guys how to open up a portable file. It's very crucial that you understand that you absolutely cannot save the file in the C drive, okay? But so let's go ahead and get started. So how we open up a portable file is we're gonna click on open an existing file. Now, once again, if you have the accountant um, version, you have a fourth option that allows you to open up a other another company's file, whether it's Pro, Premier, Enterprise, whatever it is, right? You have the accountant's ability to open up an accountant's copy. But in this case, if you don't have it, then you only have three options, a working data file, a backup, or a portable file. Now, in this case, all the classroom files are portable files. Okay, so I'm going to click next. Now, the first thing I got to do is I have to locate where I have placed my portable files. So in this case, I designated a specific folder in the LVPDA accounting QuickBooks class student portable file. And here I'm going to be using um, the final 2021 student portable files. I'm going to go ahead and locate sales process because that's what chapter two is about it's about the sales process so pqrs okay okay i have setup reports okay so i missed it setup and setup okay here we go progress pqrs oh never mind uh sales 21 okay here you go i have it sales 21 okay and i'm going to go ahead and double click on that and now the next step is to ask you where to save it now once again this is where it's very crucial because the first thing it's going to take you is straight to the quickbooks c drive okay this is where um this is the place that you downloaded your program now for those who are not the owner of their computers, unfortunately, or admins of the computers, unfortunately, it will give you an error message saying that you cannot save it here, all right? Reason being because it's your local C drive. It's, it's exclusively for just program files uh, or programs itself. It's not meant for you to save extra junk on there, okay? So what you have to do is you're gonna have to drop down this menu and if you have not done so already you have a few options okay you have options to either save it onto your desktop okay now if you save it onto your desktop your desktop will be cluttered with a lot of files because a quickbooks file splits into three okay it has um, the running file it has the actual working data file and so on and so forth so in this case once again best recommendation is to just save it to your documents okay now for if you guys remember i've also once again created an actual specific folder for your class so it's under uh, under uh, portable files but this time it's under your class pm quickbooks 7 six now if you take a look at all of the files that i've been saving on here that's exactly what i'm doing i'm just creating this folder and i'm just making a spot so then i'm opening the working data file so once i find once i locate this folder right it's separate from my c drive i am now going to go ahead and click save now sometimes um if the QuickBooks is outdated, because once again, we're looking at a 2021 file in July when these were preset for last year because um, the 2021 uh, program actually released last year. Okay. Now, with that being said, um, sometimes you may need to update the file. You may need to um, update it to the newest feature, whatever it is. Okay, um, but for now, uh, it depends on your internet and depends on how um, much capacity your computer is, it's able to process it either quicker or, or slow. Okay, so in this case, it's, it's opening up. Now, it's going to ask me for my password at the beginning of every book. 
it will tell you the exact file and the exact password. So in this case, it's all universal amongst all of the files. It's always going to be Questiva, which I have my cap locks on. Okay, it's Questiva, Q-U-E-S-T-I-V-A 21. Okay, and then here it says that QuickBooks says top um, needs to be updated. So what you're going to do is you're going to say yes. Okay, it's important that you update the file because once again, uh, we're looking at it in as of July. By updating the file, it will bring it up to date to the most recent um, latest features, fixtures, or whatever it is that it is doing. Okay. So when it, let it take its time, and it will open up by itself, okay? So there you go. Now it's starting to open up the icon bar, and it gives you this message that's saying you have successfully opened up QuickBooks. So once again, you'll have this. Oftentimes, you'll get this right here. Um, this, is, um, this is if you're doing the trial version. It will just give you a reminder saying, hey, you know, you're on this uh, trial version. This is just a reminder to sign up, whatever it is, okay? And I click Remind Me Later. Um, but if I click on Remind Me Later, this so this one pops up. This is on the accountant's version. It's just basically a little, um, like an extra home page for the accountant. There's nothing that you really need to do here, so you can just close that out because this book is meant to teach the other ones, Pro, Premier, and, um, and Accountant, okay? So once again, now I successfully opened up my working data file, and now we can go ahead and get started with the chapter, okay? So here we are, chapter two. We are on page 33. Um, if you did your reading, then this is going to be pretty, you know, kind of easy for you guys. Now, I'm looking at this, and here it's going to be starting off with how the company keeps track of its sales. So very similar to vendors, right? If we have credit vendors and, and um, cash vendors, it's the same thing that goes with your customers. We have our cash customers and we also have credit customers. Now, here's the difference between them because how we record a sale is going to be based on are they a cash customer or are they credit customer? Okay, so the two things that we're going to be splitting up the sales for is introducing to you what a sales receipt does. Now, a sales receipt is going to be your cash customers who pay at time of sale or service, whatever it is, right? So, for example, any person that comes and walks into your store, they buy whatever they need to buy, you go up to the counter, and they pay for it right then and there, that's going to be where you're going to be recording this sale as a sales receipt, okay? They are people who pay at time of service, okay? Well, the other one is going to be your invoice, okay? Because your invoice are going to be your credit customers. People who want, who say, hey, can I please put this on an account? Can I use my credit card, my store credit card, which is basically an, an account? Now, okay, do not confuse like a regular credit card versus a store credit card, okay? A store credit card is when you actually have access to only that store, where a regular credit card allows you to go anywhere with that credit card and you're only the credit card company, not this store company, okay? So your credit customers are going to be people who place their um, sales, the thing that they purchase you, from you, and they put it on an account, right? And they say, hey, I will owe you later. So in this context is when a customer pays after time of sale. So you completed your sale, but they just don't pay you right then and there. They pay you later on by you invoicing them and they send over a payment, okay? So that's the difference between when we talk about the sales process here. And that's the difference is that when we recognize this type of customer, we have to associate with them with two separate sales forms. One 
for owing me money and one for receiving the money at time um, at the very moment that you sold a product to them. Okay. Now, once again, let's take a look at our home page. So now that we already finished our first section, which is understanding this little bills, um, when this bills section here, now we're going to be moving on to our customer center or this cut the middle section right here where we're dealing with our customers. So as you can see, there's a lot that we have to do with our customers, right? Here's our sales, uh, sales receipt. Right. If you follow that line down, it goes straight to record deposits. If you follow this um, create your invoice, you follow this down here, you're going to receive a payment and then you're going to follow it throughout to actually um, recording the deposit. Now, this is going to be very, very similar of what a real company actually does, because in this sense, right? When we do receive cash or when we do receive money from our customers, what do we have to do? We need to go and actually physically and deposit the money into the bank account. So that's what this little make deposit window is or record deposits window is for you to collect your money. And then the day that you go ahead and go and submit the, all the cash and all the checks that are received in your hands and you dump it into your bank, that's where you have to let QuickBooks know. Because in this case, you can't just say when you receive the check, it's going to go automatically to your bank. No, you physically have to go deposit it. So that's the same idea here. Okay. Um, so make sure that you understand this flow of transactions. Now, Notice that when I, I look at this, it's broken down into statements. It's also broken down to statement charges, et cetera, et cetera. This section down below here is going to be dealt with in chapter three, okay? Chapter two is just focusing on just the sales process itself, okay? So we're just only focusing on sales receipt and um, recording invoices, okay? And receiving payments and also depositing our funds, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at our book. Now, in this case, we are gonna be taking a look at how to enter in our vendor, all right? A few other things too, right? So here it talks about estimates and here it talks about sales form. Now, once again, what is an estimate? A estimate is pretty much when you give a customer a bid, a quote, or some kind of um, idea about what your products are and what services you provide, okay? Now, in this case, um, estimates are not guaranteed sales, right? Because in this case, people are just shopping around. They're calling all the places and getting a quote so they can kind of, you know, um, decide which one is going to benefit the most. So in this case, right, this is just basically a shopper's, um, kind of, um, you know, way to gather information, okay? And that's what estimates are, okay? And then sales orders is where a customer wants a particular item and tells you in advance so you can provide it to them either the day of or a day later or, uh, you know, you can have it readily available for them to pick up, okay? Now, these estimates and, and sales orders we will learn that on Thursday, okay? This section here, estimates and sales orders will be talked about on Thursday. So as I mentioned before, customers is a huge, huge section of this book. It's broken up into three chapters, chapter two, chapter three, and chapter 13, okay? So that's why this, uh, this is very, very important that you do know because customers is a huge aspect of your business. Okay? So like I've mentioned before, let's go ahead and talk about the customers. So we're going to be setting up a customer. So please, everybody, if you could uh, follow along with me on page 38. Okay, we're going to be entering a customer. Okay, now First rule of thumb is let's talk about the customer center. 
So once again, there are only three ways you can get to the customer center, all right? You can get to the customer on this customers tab right here on the home page. You can go up to customers on the menu bar and you have the customer center. Or you can locate the customer center by going onto your icon bar and clicking that little icon that says customers right there, okay? Those are the only three ways that you can get into the customer center. And watch this. So the minute I click on my customer center, it looks identical to the vendor center, right? Uh, oh, not that part. This part, okay? So here is a list of all of your customers with their respective balances. On the right side, you have a little bit of customer information, so their name, uh, their address, you know, quick, basically a quick info card. And then, of course, down below is every transaction that you have between you and this customer. So once again, you can do a lot on the customer center, exactly just like the vendor center, right? Up here, you have new transactions that allow you to do all of this, right? You can either enter, um, you can um, enter an estimate, a sales order, invoice, um, sales receipt, right? You could do statements, okay, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now that's just the that's just the more common ones that you can do, right? You could either do new transactions, or once again, if you go down to the bottom here, you also have manage transactions, okay? Now, if you want the most that you can do in the customer center, you just select on a, a customer and you right click on it. And there you have like more in more um, things that you can do in the customer center. Now, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that you can do. And that's why it's broken up into three chapters. So I'm going to focus right again. Like I've mentioned before, we're just going to focus on just the sales part alone. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about how customer statements work and then the end, how to set up your sales tax. And then the day after is going to be talking about estimates and sales orders. Okay. So first thing that we got to do is we have to enter in a new customer. So once again, your only option in order for you to enter in a new customer is either through the home, uh, sorry, not the home page, either through the customer center right under new uh, new customer or you can right click anywhere on the customer list and you can click new customer okay the other one is the quick add feature which we got to take a look for yesterday and we're going to also do once again in this um in this chapter okay so once again there's only three ways that you can enter in a customer Right? You need to find some way to get to the customer center. And your only option is either do new customer or right click new or you quick at them when you're in this, any form that you are in. Okay? So once again, um, they also have the, the same feature that you can add multiple customers at one time. Once again, um, it's identical to the vendor center except um, when you're dealing with a customer list, you if you have a preset customer list of already available, you can import it into QuickBooks and it will pretty much give you all your customer lists in, in, pretty quickly. But in this case, the book um, only teaches you how to enter in a customer one at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and click on new customer and now we are going to enter in all the information for this customer, okay? So first things first is going to be the customer name. Now, once again, if you fill this part in, this right here is going to show you what you want to see on your customer list, okay? But if you don't add anything here, and you start filling in it right away, it will automatically populate up at the top, okay? However, okay, if you, if you choose to fill this part in at the top because you want to organize your customers in a specific way, 
For example, if you notice that in your uh, customer center, right, I'm gonna close this window real quick, every person is in order by their last name, okay? They're not in order by their first name. They're in order by their last name. So in this case, because we are see, we see this list according by their last name, I'm going to follow that trend as well. So I'm going to go ahead and click on new customer, add new customer. Okay. And I'm going to follow that same pattern as well. So in this case, right, the person I'm going to be adding is going to be Mr. Fang. Tim, okay, simple, right? That's what I want to display on my um, customer list, okay? Now, this individual, once again, we leave this uh, open balance uh, blank. Now, of course, whatever uh, you want to place this customer as, if you want to say he was a customer since, um, since December, 18, whatever, you could do whatever you want. This part, it's, uh, oh, in this case, this is as of, uh, but in this case, we don't need to add anything here if you don't want to, um, especially if you don't add any um, balances in there. Uh, they, like I said, they recommend not to put anything there just because you could say that Mr. Tim Fang owes me this much money, but you didn't tell them how they owe you the money. So the best way to, to enter in all these account balances is by the entering invoices for Mr. Tim Fang. Okay. So once again, Mr. Tim Fang is not a company, so you can skip this field right here. And now you can go ahead and enter him his name. Now, he's not a mister. He's a doctor. Okay. So he's doctor, right? And um, I'm going to hit tab, Mr. Tim, okay, tab, his middle name is S, okay, and then last name, Fang, okay, simple as that. Now, I don't know why your QuickBooks says this, but if they're not a company, why is he the owner? Is he the owner of himself? Apparently, that's what you want to tell QuickBooks. So in this case, I'm going to leave it blank because this part doesn't make sense. How can you be a owner if you're an individual? You can't own yourself, can you? You're not an owner of any company. So in that part, I'm going to leave that blank. All right. So now the next step is going to tell me what is going to be his main phone number. Okay. Let's see, what does the book say? The main phone number. It say 408-555-8298. Good, okay. He only has a main phone number line, right? They can have multiple lines, but in this case, he only has one, okay? His main email is going to be DRF for Dr. Fang at doctor.biz or df.biz. Okay, so df.biz. Okay. Um, and then, of course, website. I mean, he doesn't have to, you don't have to fill any of that information in. Okay, now um, that should be good enough. Now, let's talk about his billing address, okay? His billing address is going to be, um, it says here that it is 300 North First. 300, yeah, 300 North First Street, San Jose, California. Nine five one three six. Mm -hmm. Nine five one three six. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Now, once again, you have the option right here whether if Mr. Tim Fang wants us to send or ship anything to him, it's going to be the same as his billing date. I'm billing address, okay? 
So in this case, right, I'm gonna go ahead and copy it because this is true. It's the same, it's going to be the same. Now you do have options at the very top here. This could be to shipping address one, or this could be his home or his office. In this case, this is to his office, okay? So once I have that there, right? Now check this out. Mr. Tim Fang, because he's a customer, he can have multiple locations on where he wants to ship items to. So this is very common, especially when, uh, for example, you buy gifts for other people, you ship them by surprise to their address. So that's what you could do. You can have as many addresses as you want for this person. Now, again, you want to make sure that you, you can set um, a shipping destination so it could be automatic. And if they were to just go ahead and send a gift to someone else, they can say, I want my shipping address to be this person. So again, uh, this is a lot more easier online because you can select and choose, or if they're calling you for this, they you can confirm with them that this is the correct address. So in this case, um, this is his office. So it's gonna be 300 North 1st Street, okay? And it's gonna be San Jose, California, 95136, okay? So once again, they can have as many addresses as, as they possibly can, okay? So that's the first one. Now the next section is going to be talking about payment. So this is where uh, this is so this is where it's asking for account number. Now because he's a custom he's a customer, this is the account number that you give to Mr. Tim Fang. Okay? This is the account number that you give to Mr. Tim Fang. So once again, let's see what it says. Account number is 3546. Okay. In this case, because you are the person that's providing the service, you can give them a credit limit. In this case, I'm going to give Mr. Tim Fang $8,000 credit. Now, once again, there's a lot of logistics on where this number can come from, right? Especially if you're running social securities just to, um, you know, get a background check on whether they're capable of um, paying you for this debt. So once again, um, it could be also if you want to say all customers get $8,000, great. Okay. So in this case, his credit limit is $8,000. Okay. Then now the next one is going to be... Um, his, it's going to be, um, his terms, his terms is only going to be net 30. So, uh, payment terms is going to be net 30. So he actually does not get any discounts from me. Okay. Now we're going to talk about what it says, what it means to be a price level. So once again, we, I think I briefly mentioned this yesterday, a price level is going to be for your, especially for your customers, right? There's a difference on when you can, what you can charge a specific customer. All right, we talked about this in chapter seven. When we're setting up different price levels for different specific people, we're basically categorizing them based on um, price points, okay? So for example, if someone is a commercial user, they're more likely to be you're they're more likely to need more production, need more special equipment, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Where you can't charge your residents or smaller people who are regular, right? You can't charge them the same price as a commercial business because they're more likely not able to afford it. Okay? So once again, I'm gonna choose commercial because that's what he is. Okay. Now the next thing is going to be preferred um, method of receiving invoices. In this case, they tell us to leave it at email. Okay. Now the next thing that they, they want to say here is now is going to be what kind of preferred method do they want to pay us in? Now in this case, they like to pay us using Visa credit card. So this is why it is so important that you protect your QuickBooks, um, your QuickBooks 
file because you are entering super sensitive data. You're entering credit card numbers from your customers. So if someone gets a, their hands on this file, they have everybody's credit, credit card information and they can hack them and they can steal them. Okay, and they have a lot of information on each customer. They have their name, their full name, their address and everything. So that's why it's very important that you create a password and lock this up because I'm about to enter in a credit card information for Mr. Tim Fang, okay? Because he said that uh, he uses Visa. Now this is good for two things, okay? One is if you are dealing with a bunch of customers you know, you can save the credit card information so you don't have to type it in every single time you um, do a sales receipt or do a sales form because you already have their credential information. But once again, that could be selective based on the person. Do they want you to hold on to this information? You can always select that, no, I don't want you to memorize or save this credit card information on here. Or you can call them up and tell, hey, I don't want, I don't, I, I just want you to do it one time, okay? Now, second thing too about having this information is so then um, it makes it so much easier for you to process um, um, a lot quicker because like, again, you have all the information, right? Especially if it's a credit card, it will go almost instant, okay? So here... The credit card number is, okay, it's really weird because in your book, it's missing a number. It's supposed to be 1234567891010. Now, they forgot a number because I, as far as credit cards, about 95% of them are 16 digits. They're either 16 or 12. In this case, this one only has 15 digits. So um, I added an, an extra one after the zero, and I said it was one, two, three, four, once again. So this should be a correct version of the credit card number, okay? So um, expiration date, okay? In this case, I believe it is December or May. Let me see. It's 1225. December 25th. Yes, December that's what I thought. December in the year 2025. Now, it pops up 21. No, it's 25. Okay. Now, uh, what's the name on the card holder? It, see, if by just me clicking, it should say it pops up Tim S. Fang. Maybe that's his name on the credit card, right? And the address, billing address, should be the same. And the zip code is going to be whatever the zip code is. Now, there's one thing that you need to know about holding credit card information is that it is illegal to save the SSV code on the back of the credit card. Okay. Now, what is the SSV code? It is the security uh, validation code, the three digits on the back of your credit card. Only you can be, uh, you can tell the person what that code is to validate and verify and authorize that this payment is done by you and that you're giving the authorization to charge this credit card. You cannot keep this number for any reason because that is illegal to hold that kind of information and because then you have access to that person's credit card and you could say, I want to authorize this and this and this. As a business, you um, you have the ethical code where you have to keep this um, um, information confidential, right? You cannot keep the SSV code or the CCV code, whatever it's called, right? It's the security code on the back of your card, right? You can't hold on to it. All right, so that's it for that one. So the next section we have here is to enter in his sales tax information. So once again, because he's a regular customer to me, right? He's not, he doesn't work for the government agent. He definitely doesn't work for a nonprofit. So because he's just a regular customer, I'm going to charge him at the regular tax, okay? Unless whatever, um, if I provide a service, then it's going to be tax free, okay? Now, what kind of um, what kind of 
area code or county do we tax him at? I believe it's going to be Santa Clara. Okay. And then last but not least, it's going to be um, a resale number. Now, this number is only for in case this person is per making purchases from you and they're reselling it to someone else. If they are acting as if you're the wholesaler and they are the retailer, that's what a resale number is, right? In this case, he's just a regular customer, so no need for this, right? And now we finally reach our end um, point right here, which is additional information. Now, once again, what kind of customer type is he? He's definitely business, okay? He's business, okay? Um, I don't know why they didn't select individual, but I guess he is business related. Whatever. Maybe um, he, 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 since he's a doctor, he, it's business related because maybe he has grand openings that wants photo shoots for. I don't know. But, and then the last, and then second to last here is going to be sales representative. Now, sales representative, if you choose to have a sales representative on here, or if you choose to, for your um, employees to get commissions, then that's where you can utilize this little field right here, where you can say this person or this sales representative belongs to this person. And that way, you can run your reports to see how much sales each person did and determine whether they deserve a bonus or not, okay? Now, once again, that's only if you offer commissions or bonuses based on a sales percentage. But in this case, um, this they, 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 they said, just go ahead and um, say that Mike, Mizu Mike Mizuki, Mizuki, he's the one who um, got Tim... S. Fang as a customer, okay? And then last but not least, we have the county. The county is, again, um, I believe it's Santa Clara once again. Let's see. Yep, Santa Clara. Okay. Once again, if you want to have defined fields for this customer, go ahead and add it, right? We looked at this three times already, right? We saw it in um, defined fields. We saw it in chapter 12 when we we're talking about it. And we also saw it in our vendors, right? So if you want to choose to add extra information for Mr. Tim S. Fang, you can go ahead and click define fields and so on and so forth, okay? Last section we have here is going to be a job, okay? Job costing. Now, once again, this is only relevant if you are going to be assigning Tim specific jobs. Or in this case, right, when we talk about job costing, we talk about, um, you know, buying things for this specific customer, right? Or having a client uh, specifically work with this particular customer. If there is a need for you to assign any kind of job or item, then you go ahead and list it here. This is the job costing section. But if you don't need to, and just like the book says, we're not going to be needing to do it, we don't need to fill this section out at all. So all we have to do is finally click OK. And once again, it's saved. And there is Tim S. Fang. Okay, or Tim Fang. Okay, so once again, you can modify this any time that you want. You can add a customer anytime you want as well, right? You can do that by um, hitting this little um, this uh, little pencil icon right there. You can call. Actually, no, this pencil icon right there. You can pin stuff to them. You can also add any any extra information on Tim S. Fang. Maybe you want to add like an identification photo so you can recognize Mr. Tim Fang. That's what that file little clip, little um, paper clip is for, okay? So any questions on adding a new customer? Okay, excellent. So then, Let's see what section is next, okay? 
So now that we got to take a look at um, adding our first customer, okay, there are, uh, once again, so that whole section that I was talking about earlier is all about job costing. What is job costing? Right here explains to you when you want to divide or categorize your income and your expenses based on the customers and you want to assign them. So once again, this is more prevalent in chapter nine when we talk about time and billing. So in this case, right, we already have it activated, right? Because in this case, we do use job costing, okay? Um, for Imagine Photography, but in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and skip right over it. Now let's talk about recording sales. So this is where we get to take a look at our very first sales receipt. So once again, if, if a customer decides to pay at time of service, whether it's by cash, by check, by credit card, by an electronics funds transfer, any means that you receive money for completing a sale or a service, you're going to be using a sales receipt. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, just like entering a bill, right? Entering a sales receipt, there are six different ways that you can enter in a sales receipt. Okay, you already have your first one right here on your homepage, right? Create sales receipt, right? If you go to customers on your menu bar, you can enter in a sales receipt right there. Create, oh, wrong one. Create sales receipt. Where are you? Okay, enter sales receipt. There you go. Once again, if you make your way to the customer center, you have three ways to enter it in that way as well, right? You have new transactions at the top, sales receipt. You can right click on somebody, enter sales receipt. You can even do manage transaction, sales receipt, okay? Um, and then the last way that you can enter it in is going to be using the income tracker. So once again, income tracker, right? Even though it's not technically going to be on here, but you could actually enter it in regardless the sales receipt this way, okay? Because the income tracker is basically any means that you collect income, whether it's through an invoice or whether it's through a sales receipt. So once again, those are the six different ways that you can enter in a sales receipt. And guess what? Those are the same exact ways that you can enter an invoice, okay? So the same exact ways, right? Homepage, uh, menu bar, when you go into the customer center, you have new transactions, manage transactions, and right click here, same thing here. You go to manage transactions, boom sales receipt okay so once again i'm just gonna go close this window out because i don't want to use this way i'm just going to show you how to just do it on the home page just to make it a lot more easier and i just clicked it out of it so there you go so home page it is Oop. home page it is okay so once again i'm going to go ahead and click on create sales receipt so just like we've seen before, it's very similar to entering a bill. Except there's, of course, extra, extra, extra fields that we have here that you can utilize to create your sales receipt, okay? So the very first thing here is if you're on uh, the page where it shows you how to enter it in, I need you to be on this page right here, page 45, to help me enter in all the information for Mr., I believe this is Jerry Perez. We're going to be entering Jerry Perez, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, QuickBooks here. 
sales receipt. I'm starting what page you Four, I think I was on 43. Let's see. Okay, oh, if you're looking at the window, then yes, the picture is on 47. But, however, if you actually just read what it says here, step three, you're going to be entering a customer. Oh, okay, you're right. Okay, hold on. Ah. Okay, so the information... And yes, starts on page 45, and then that's where you're reading the information. But if you're looking at just the window, it's going to be on page 47 if you don't want to go through the actual text. So in this case, I am going to be entering Jerry Perez into my account. Okay, so once again, let's go ahead and take a look at my sales receipt and um, exactly how we talked about it. So Jerry Perez... Let's go ahead and type his name in. So, Jerry Perez. Does he exist? No, he doesn't. Okay? So, in this case, I have to type it in exactly how I see it. Perez, comma, Jerry. And I'm going to go ahead and add the name. Okay? Or you could click enter because it's going to pop up this window saying, Hey, QuickBooks doesn't recognize his name. Do you want a quick ad? And in this case, yes. Okay. Now, it didn't ask me whether this person was a vendor, customer, or employee. Why? Because sales receipts is automatic for customers only. Okay. Thank you. Now, for the class. Okay. So, in this case, he is from, this, he is from okay. San Jose. Okay. San Jose. Okay. So here, this is what I was talking about, the templates, right? If you want to have a sales uh, or pre-made sales form or some kind of, uh, you know, custom-made form, this is where you can toggle it here, right? In your book, it tells you this too when you open up an invoice or, um, you know, a sales receipt form, you're able to um, toggle it here to say, well, I want to use this purse, this one, or this one. In this case, it, it tells you to leave it as custom sales um, form. Now, now, Mr. Jerry Perez, he purchased quite a lot from us, okay? And they tell you to go ahead and make sure that you identify that he paid via check, okay? So, let's see what day did he um, make this purchase. He purchased this on January. January 27. January 27. Okay. Now they recommend you to create some kind of sales number in a way that will make it easier for you to keep track of. So in this case, they recommend you to use. 2021 because that's the year that you made the sale and in this case um i believe the reference is one 2021 one yeah. okay saying this is going to be my very first sales receipt of the year 2021 okay now other things that you need to do here is you need to make the list of the items that Mr. Jerry Perez purchased from us, okay? So in this case, right, he purchased outdoor photo sessions, okay? Now, when I type in my items, notice that this, notice that all these items are popping up. We will learn about items in chapter eight. So um, after your midterm or after your first exam, we're going to go ahead and dive right into items. So items, like we've talked about, right? This was a pre-notion. Items are things that we create to represent that we're either selling a service, product, or anything that's involved with the sales itself. Okay? So in this case, I am selling a service called Outdoor Photo Session. Now, notice this. Because these are pre-made items, right? 
by me clicking on it, it automatically filled in on the form what an outdoor photo session is. Right here's the description. What the price point is and what you tax it as. In this case, it's a service, okay? Services are non-taxable, okay? Why? I don't know why, but I know that this means if they're not being taxed on a service because it's based on someone's time, you know, there's there's extra ways um, that this person can make up the money or there is like, uh, what do you call it? Instead of getting taxed, um, this service is non-taxed because it's based on the person, it's based on labor, okay? Um, okay, and services, right? They tend to be tipped, okay? Now, quantity, right, as you notice here, it says right here that the rate is $95 per photo session. Now, let's take a look at my amount right there. It says it's 95. If I type in, in here, quantity three, and I move away or I click or I press tab, notice this, it's gonna automatically calculate whatever three times 95 is, okay? Once again, if 95 isn't what your selling price is, you can always modify it and adjust it right there. So what if this person um, is an old time friend and you wanna modify it and you say, well, I'm gonna give him the photo session for $75. And you can go ahead and type it in right there, okay? So sales price, selling price is not fixed. It's always adjustable, okay? Then he also bought premium photo packages, okay? So right here, and I believe he bought two of them. Did he buy two of them for the premium photo packages? Yes, he bought two premium photo packages, all right? So therefore, now it's getting a grand total right here. Now, this is where it's important because right here, since we didn't identify because Mr. Jerry Perez is a new client, right? We just quick added him. He has no information here. Therefore, what am I going to tax him as? He's definitely not out of state. So I'm going to charge him at Santa Clara tax. Okay. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to charge him at Santa Clara tax. So therefore, that was that is 8.25%. And here you go. Once again, the only items that could be taxed right here is only going to be based on the photo packages because this is a product. Products are 100% to be guaranteed to be taxed. Okay? So there you go. He's going to be taxed $14. So therefore, he owes me a grand total of $469.03. Okay? Now... You can send a message to your customer, right? In this case, I want to thank him for his business. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you for your business, right? You can add any message that you want to say to your customer, whether it's a, uh, a business motto saying, you know, keep smiling or, you know, gotcha, whatever it is that is your company model, company logo. You can go ahead and add that as part as um, as part as part of the customer message. So in this case, I already have it pre-built saying thank you for your business. Now your memo. This memo is gonna is what's gonna appear on your customer statement. So it's important that you recognize what is this invoice about. This invoice is about is going to be three outdoor sessions. and two photo packages, okay? And once again, we can go ahead and click save and close, All right? Now I'll give you this window saying, you have changed this person's information. Would you like to record it or save it? You click yes. And once again, you're gonna get that beep of approval. And now that is how you enter in a sales receipt. See, now take, take a look at this. We entered in a sales receipt. There's one thing I forgot to add. I forgot to add 
the check number. Oh, how did I do that? Well, let's take a look where I can find that transaction. So there's two ways you could find the transaction. You can use the sales receipt and go to the previous one. Or you can actually look up Mr. Um, Jerry Perez. So he should be somewhere here. Um, here's Pang P -p -p -p. Uh, Where is he? Oh, there you go. Jerry Perez. Okay. And look, there's my very invoice that I just made. Right? If I double click on it, I can modify every single thing that I want on here at any given time. So, for example, maybe this guy, he was like, oh, I forgot to buy this. You could, well, you would charge a separate account. But if he was in the middle of this, you could, you know, cancel it or in this case, void it or undo it and then just charge another one. That's what most people tend to do. Now, in this case, the check number that Mr. Jerry Perez wrote was check number, let's see, check number, do you guys see where the check number is? I see the date, class, uh, San Jose, um, Take your mouth straight up about the 286. No, <laughs> not where it's on the. Not, <laughs> not, thank you. That's what I meant. 9459. <laughs> no, 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 3459. 3459. That's what I meant. Not not where it is on the form, but <laughs> but what it is um in your book. <laughs> 3495. You did, you did use the word where though. Okay. okay, I'm sorry, okay. In this case, not on the screen, but all in your book. Okay, so it is 3950, uh 50, 90, 95, 95 or 59? Oh, 59. 59, that's what I thought. 59. Perfect. <laughs> 3459. Okay, and then I can go ahead and save and close. Once again, it's gonna say you are you are making transaction changes to this transaction. You say yes. Okay, now you got that beep of approval once again. Now, with that being said, now that it entered in a sales receipt and I received a check, check, take a look at my records deposit. It's now popped up a little red bubble saying, hey, you have one deposit pending. Okay. <laughs> Any questions in regards to entering a sales receipt? Okay, so next section here is talking about what happens when you need to have this location for the undeposited funds. Now, QuickBooks creates this undeposit uh, funds account for you automatically because once again, um, in this idea, right, when you collect money, it doesn't go right away to your checking account. You have to actually physically take the check and deposit it to the bank for it to verify that the check has gone through and that um, you actually have money in your bank account, okay? So once again, I'm gonna skip this chapter, this section right here because we will talk more about it when we finish up all of our um, transactions and um, record our deposits then, okay? So now that uh, that is all there, the next section is going to be talking about creating invoices okay so let's go ahead and take a look here for how we can create an invoice so please be on page um 50 because here it's going to tell you how i'm going to be filling out this invoice so once again we're going to be dealing with mr bob mason okay so Let's go ahead and create our invoice. So as I've mentioned before, every single way that you guys know how to enter in a sales receipt is going to be the same six ways that you can enter in an invoice, okay? So in this case, I'm just gonna take the easiest way, which is going to be located on your home page. And there we have it. This 
sales ref, as this sales form, the invoice, looks more or less identical to a sales receipt, except one thing. You don't have the method of payment. And that's it. <laughs> that's the difference between a sales receipt and an invoice is that you just don't have the method of payment. So in this case, I'm going to be entering the same information. The only difference is that there's going to be things like terms, right? So this, in this case, this exact invoice has terms displayed on it. So if you guys remember from way back when, when I was on a sales form and it didn't show the terms, now this one, because it's a custom made one, it also, it shows, it displays the, the terms on there. So once again, I'm going to be having Mr. Bob Mason here. Now, once I've entered that in, all his information has filled in, including his terms and including the discount dates and whatnot. Okay. So that's Mr. Bob Mason. So see how it's much easier by entering all the information for a particular person, so in this case, a customer, helps you fill out each invoice, each sales receipt form much easier, okay? So in this case, class, right? In this case, it tells us to actually add in that he belongs to San Jose, okay? To leave this um, template alone, okay? And then now, let's go ahead and enter in all the information that we need for this invoice, okay? So we have Mr. Bob Mason, okay? Class of San Jose. Date of service, once again, is still January 27, okay? Invoice, now check this out. My invoice number, as you can see, says 2019-108. So in this case, I need to manually change this because this we're not in 2019 anymore. We're in 2021, and I'm making this invoice number 106. So 2021-106, okay? So then from here on out, the next invoice I create, QuickBooks is automatically going to start creating a series. So then the next number that you, the next invoice that you enter in, it's going to say 2021-107. Okay, and I'll show you an example right after this. Okay. So once again, now we can go ahead and fill this form exactly what, what we've been doing before, except because of the template, now it's kind of reverse and backwards, right? So now quantity is first, the item is next, and then um, the description is next and so on and so forth. So first things first is uh, Mr. Bob Mason. He bought one indoor photo session. Okay. Yes, he bought one indoor, so he bought one, okay? Indoor photo session. And then he also bought one standard photo package. So he got a standard photo package. Okay. All right, awesome. Now everything looks good, right? 95 for each uh, pack for each session, 55 for each uh, photo package, okay? So there you go. Simple and easy as that. Because we filled his information prior, he belongs to Santa Clara Tax. So all this information is already done. Okay, it's already filled in for us. So now, all we got to do is now thank him for your business. Okay. And we got to record that he got one indoor photo session. Okay. And one photo package okay and then now we can go ahead click save and close because now we invoiced mr um bob mason and let's check it out he we gave him terms right that means this whole entire bill is due on uh it should be due on february 27th oh that's a ship date sorry 
So here it doesn't tell us when it's due or anything like that, but we should know that because we're going to be shipping it out as of the 27th, it's going to be due in 30 days. Good. Okay. So there we go. Save and close. Once again, beep of approval means you validate that that invoice has been there. Okay. Once again, if you need to find where that is, you can choose to go through the customer center or you can use the income tracker. So once again, income tracker allows you to see everything that people owe you. And then it also even goes as far as letting you know how many people have um, accounts that are due, how many people have paid or how many people um, have or how many people who overdo. Okay. So that's what's really cool about there. And here you go. There you go. I have all these invoices of people who still owe me money. All right. Any questions on how to enter in an invoice? When they pay the, when they pay the invoice, it disappears from the Income tracker, right? It depends because we talk, we will talk. Um, I think we're gonna have to do it tomorrow, but since it's already four o'clock, um, if we get that far, um, there is a section where once we go into receiving payments, there's a possibility where the customer make might make a partial payment, okay? So it's gonna be half of the payment, for example, if you pay half. Just uh, the amount that is on you, no? No, it will actually, QuickBooks is smart about it. It will tell you how much the customer owes left. What's the remaining balance left? So, th but the invoice is still going to stay the same, but it's going to tell you that this person owes you half it's of the invoice. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, here, once those people have paid you, right? You're right, it does disappear from the income tracker. Because right here, I wanna see all the people that owe me money, or all the people, right? I can choose this to toggle, to find, do I want a specific person? Do I want a specific time frame? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the only way to see what uh, uh, is on the balance on reports, you can see all what you sell or what you Every, all the all the um, transactions that you did on your uh, all around uh, all year, so on the balance, the last where well, you can see that. So you can so there's 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 two ways, right? At the very end of the chapter, it tells you about running reports, running your reports on customer balance, or the best way if you just want a quick and easy overview, not have to waste uh, paper on a report. You can just simply go to your customer center and it gives you the balances right there. So once again, if I close my income tracker, if I go to my customer um, customer information, right here it gives me a balance of what they owe me. But it doesn't give me the details. If I run a report, it will tell me the details on what they owe me. Like maybe, maybe um, Maria Cruz owes me four or five invoices. Mm -hmm. Right, if but you, if you do right click on the side, it doesn't show you the all what you. Mm -hmm. If yeah, if you yeah, it. To, she, I think I think I had the same question. How to find that list? You say customer, and then, I'm sorry. How do you find this? Yeah, I don't have the customer balance. No, you have to import trans the for to profile is a new one. Nobody has yet. I didn't do that. Okay. Yes. You need to be, in order for you to see all this information, you need to be in the right portable file. Okay. In this case, if you're, if you're, if you're looking at the customer center and there's nothing there, except for Tim S. Fang, the one that you just put in, you're in the wrong file. Okay, so, but yes, when you go into your customer center, you should be able to see all of the account balances for the cap for each customer. And if you That's click- That's individual. That's individual and the report, you say uh, balance report is 
the global of the all the customers, no? Correct. If I understood that, okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, any questions in regards to the invoices? Right now, no. Okay. So, once again, pretty straightforward. If you can enter in a sales receipt, you can enter in anything. All right. QuickBooks makes it very easy and very user friendly to go ahead and enter in everything that you need to enter in here. Okay. So once again, that was Bob Mason. What was it? No, I said it's a lot of the information for the test. I don't know how I'm going to put through all of this because I understand, but to remember everything is a little bit hard. Well, I, that's why I don't, I don't ask you to remember anything. Instead, I have you guys have the book for the exam, okay? All right, so next section here is going to be talking about how we actually use calculated items. Now, this is very important, especially when we're dealing with customers and or uh, we have like in-store discounts or certain things like that, or special promotions, right? So this is how we can be able to show or have an item, or in this case, um, give them the discount and have it display on their actual invoice. So in this case, you need to be on page 54 for the window itself um, to help me fill out this one. So the next invoice that we're gonna be entering in once again is for Anderson Wedding. So there are many ways that you can do it, right? If you want to, you can actually just right click on Anderson Wedding. So I believe this is for Sati and Navid, if I'm not wrong. Let's see. Um, Anderson Wedding. Hold on. Invoices with calculations. Anderson Wedding. Planner. Wilson and Sarah. Okay, so wrong person. We're going to be dealing with uh, Wilson and Sarah. So here you go. I believe it's this one. Nope, nope. Wilson and Sarah. Okay. If I right click on them and I say I want to create an invoice, you can do it just like that. Create invoices. And boom, their name is right there and highlighted in there. And if I click on tab, all the information is going to fill in. Okay. Straightforward, pretty easy, okay? You can build your invoices just like that, okay? Now, once again, they both... You did another, you add an invoice of the same uh, account, to the same account, or it's a new one? This is a, this is a new one. A new, okay. Because the first one was for Mr. Bob Mason. Yes. And this is a new one. Oh, okay. This is a new one. Yes, this is for Anderson Wedding for Wilson and Sarah. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the class, right, once again, is going to be San Jose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, notice this. When I said, if you guys remember, right, when I entered in my invoice number into the other one for Bob Mason, Notice this because I'm creating another invoice. QuickBooks is smart and says, well, I'm going to go ahead and enter this in an, a specific order. In this case, it's now creating a sequence number saying that this one is going to be now your next invoice, which is for 2021-107. Okay, so that's how QuickBooks makes it also easier for it to fill out your stuff too, is that it's going to keep adding more and more information to make it more easier for you to fill out, okay? So once again, the date is uh, January 27th, so that's still the same, okay? Invoice number is 2021-107. Um, now, this guy, this person for Anderson Wedding, they purchased some cameras and a lens, Okay, so in this case, they purchased um, camera, right, SR, and in this case, they ordered three from us. Three. One okay. Yes. It, 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 it doesn't make different the, the template and the book say imagine photo and you have into it product? Um, okay, let me see. 
Okay, if you want to, it's not, I mean, once again, this is a preset one that they made. So as you can see, now everything's arranged differently. It doesn't, in this context, it doesn't matter which form that you use unless it's necessary for your company. Now, in this case, I, it, at the end of the day, I'm still filling out the same information. Okay, but I mean, if the, okay, so I changed it to Imagine Photography. So this is their specific invoice. And here now, yes, it is arranged a little differently. You can have your, S, your, your items first, and then you have your um, quantity, and then the description comes right after. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next one is that we purchased a lens, okay? Okay, so oops, I want to click on it. And um, we pur he, they purchased one, okay? Now, let's just say today we have a nice special discount. Our discount is that anything that anybody buys today is gonna be 10% discounted, okay? So let's go ahead and see this for example, right? If I go ahead and just click on this item right here and I say I want to apply a discount. So I have a discount item already made. And this time it says right here, the discount is for 10%. So if I go ahead and click on this, check this out. Notice this. I have a discount for $10. Or sorry, 10%. For $32.50. Now notice this. Why is it only why is it only $32? Okay? This right here only represents that you're only taking a discount off of the lens, which is the line above it. And that's the rule of this feature is that if you use a discount line item, it's only going to discount the product of the line above it. So in this case, it only took 10% of my lens, which right here, I've already calculated to be $324.99. So therefore, it my discount is only for $32.50. That's not what I want. I want a discount on the whole thing. So if I want to have a discount for the entire, the entire store, I have to change this item and make it a subtotal item. Okay, and what the subtotal item does is it gathers all the information and it gives you a grand total of the total purchase. So in this case, my grand total of my purchase here is $2,412.96. And then because of the idea of using the discount line item, which it takes it above, one line above, right? Since the line above it is my subtotal, I enter in my discount item. Now my 10% discount is on the overall whole entire amount. And notice this, now my discount is for $241.30. Okay. You can do the discount, uh, one question. You can do, if you write a camera and you do discount 10% and then later the lens and then percent discount is the same, right? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And that's exactly how stores, right? When you have when you have those specific sales items, right? That's how you can be able to make um, the differentiations of discounts for different products. So for yeah, so for example, if my cameras are 30% off, I can create a line item that says my cameras are 30% off. And then my lenses are only 15% off. Yes. Uh, and that's exactly why um, QuickBooks created uh, the discount line items. Yes? How do you create the discount? Do you have a different line except the 10% or, or you create yourself? You can modify the what you write there. Okay. You all, click, oh, sorry. All of those items that you have here, we're going to look in Chapter 8. Okay. Oh. Um, previously, it was learned in Chapter 7. They moved it to Chapter 8. So, unfortunately, in this, in this, in this, in this class right now, we're not on Chapter 8 yet. That's not until, uh, uh, that's not until next week. So, I wait. yeah, so you have to wait. 
So all of these items, once again, items are built around your sales process. Okay, so anything that has to deal with your sales, so whether it's a service, a product, um, a discount, sales tax, all of those are going to be considered items that you create. And I want to show you how to create those items in Chapter 8. Okay, okay thanks. So right there, right? So in this case, the discount line item is only used, right? to take a discount off of the line above it. So in this case, now that I created my subtotal line, which just basically tallied up my total, now I, I place my 10% um, discount item here, and now it's telling me that I'm taking a discount for 341, uh, two, wait, $241, okay? So then now, once that happens, he, they're gonna get taxed, Okay, 8.25%. So they're going to get charged additional $179 to get a grand total of $2,350. Okay. Okay, once again, you want to make a nice note saying thank you for your business. And let, uh, in the memo, you're going to say that they bought three cameras and one lens. And then once again, you can go ahead and click that save and close. Now, once again, it's going to say, oh, you made changes to this transaction or this person's uh, profile. You say yes. Okay. And there you have it. Okay. Any questions in regards to creating invoices at all? Okay, so let me go ahead and check the time real quick. Okay, it's 419. So I'm going to go ahead and go over two more concepts and then we will call it a day. Okay, so now going back to your book. So now that we got to take a look at entering an invoice, just a regular invoice, and how we use our invoices to um, generate um, invoices with discounted items. Now, here is what you could do too. Now, when you send invoices, for any reason, you can also attach documents to them. Once again, it says right here, do not do. That's fine. I just want to explain to you guys that every form that you create in QuickBooks, you can always attach some kind of document. So in this case, right, maybe you want to attach a purchase order or excuse me, a sales order, an estimate, right? Once again, QuickBooks, they allow you to transfer that information over. But if you want to keep track of how this person got to this invoice, or maybe um, since there was a 10% discount, maybe attach a flyer saying that you have a store-wide sale. That's why they received the discount, okay? Any way of means that you can justify um, why the sale happened or whatever it is, you can add those type documents. Once again, you can even um, include um a pamphlet right of what this person wants okay so that's that section right there you don't need to do it okay last section i want to teach you here is going to be the open invoice report so once again uh we talked about how reports are important based on what your position is going to be in the company. So in this case, right, if we are the salesperson, right, and we want to know, instead of looking here and taking a look at my um, customer center, right, I can't tell what my open invoices are. I can't tell. All I know is what they, what they owe me, okay? So again, you have two options, right? If you decide to go to your income tracker, Okay, your income tracker pretty much gives you an over um, an overall overview of each individual person and what they ordered and what invoice that they had. So this pretty much gives you a little overview of the income or the um, the open invoice balance. Okay, now however, this one you can modify to the point where you can see um, other invoices. 
okay? Um, whether uh, it's closed or not, okay? And here, you're able to add other transactions, such as add more invoices, right? This one is more interactive, where a report is, is, is straightforward, right? It's um, a document that you have that just basically gives you some kind of statistic value. So in this case, right, if I go to my reports and I go ahead and click on customers and receivables, right, I'm going to go ahead and locate my, uh, where is it, open, uh, open, open invoice right here. So there you go. Now, if I go ahead and populate this, right now I want to know what are my open invoices as today. I can also do all that existed in 2021. Okay? And let's take a look. So we have a whole bunch of people. We have a bunch for Anderson Wedding, right? We have an open invoice for Anderson Wedding. We have an open invoice for... Um, Maria Cruz, we have a bunch of invoices for Maria Cruz. We have one for Bob Mason, which we just entered in. Okay. And once again, these are your open invoices. This doesn't tell you what whether they paid or not. This is tells you when you created this invoice and when are they due. Okay. And therefore, right there, this is how much they do they owe you, what their terms are and their due dates and whether they paid or not. In this case, they're all open, meaning that they still owe you. And with this overview, you can always print this kind of report and send it to your upper management for some reason or send it to somebody who's going to, um, you know, either release statements to them or uh, pretty much give them a call saying, hey, you know, you have a bunch of open invoices, um, you know, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay, so that's your open invoice report. So once again, I am going to stop here. Um, tomorrow, what we're going to do tomorrow is I'm going to pick up from chapter two, and we're going to talk about all about the second half of chapter um, two, which is talking about what happens when we receive our payments and when we deposit our payments. Okay. Any questions um, for chapter two up to now?